Come on in. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're taking a look back at my Survivor 44 preseason cast analysis. Every season, I like to go through the cast bios and interviews and try to determine how each player will fare in the game. To keep things fun, I also like to give each player an award based on how I think they'll play or the edit they'll receive. It's like high school superlatives survivor style. The Purple Kelly Award for most likely to be invisible. The Sandra Award for most likely to win. The Zeke Smith Award for most likely to catch Big Moveitis. You get the idea. Once the season wraps, I also like to take a look back at my initial cast assessment and see how right or wrong, more likely wrong, I was. Along the way, I'll award myself points for accuracy, 18 players, 18 points possible. I'll give myself a full point for a player who I really accurately pegged preseason, a half point for players where my analysis was pretty close in some regards, but fairly off in others, and no points for players where I completely missed the mark. As always, we'll consider this a success if I get nine or more points, half the total possible. Did my prediction for first boot make the finale again? Let's find out as we revisit my Survivor 44 preseason cast analysis. Let's head things off with our episode one medevac, Bruce Peralt, who I gave the Tom Laidlaw award for most likely to be way too loyal. So, uh, what do you want from me? Bruce cracked his head open like an egg five seconds into the game and was medevaced later that day. Didn't see that one coming. Nevertheless, here's what I initially said about Bruce. It's Survivor's oldest archetype, literally. Guy over 40 who plays a loyalty-based, old-school style game. He rides or dies with one or two other players and is either in the final five or the first five out. No exceptions. I think Bruce fits right into that mold because he, well, he tells us that's what he wants to do. But also, he's just a no BS kind of guy. I'm feeling pretty good about Bruce's chances. A lot of people on this cast are looking for someone who's going to be the exact kind of ally you can tell Bruce is just from a glance. So Bruce's success will be based on whether he hitches his horse to someone in the majority or not. I'm betting he will. And smaller tribes only make it easier for this type of player to succeed. If he goes out early, it's probably to weaken his ally. But I'm feeling like Bruce is in the game for the long haul as a dependable provider and alliance mate. So I was pretty solid on Bruce's chances as a loyal foot soldier. It seemed like things were heading that way for him. No pun intended. But Bruce didn't really get the chance to play, so half point for his half day in the game? Seems fair. Maybe we can retroactively raise or lower this one after Survivor 45. Moving on to our first boot proper, Maddie Pomia, who was the recipient of the Cass McKeon Award for most likely to cause chaos. So Maddie was on the wrong end of an idol at the season's wild first tribal council, so the chaotic side of her didn't really get the chance to shine as well as it should have. Nevertheless, I do think I had a pretty solid read on Maddie's potential and her longevity in the game. The chaotic energy emanating off of Maddie is honestly already iconic. Feral, wild card, middle child. Maddie reminds me of Sydney Siegel if she was able to survive more than one tribal council. Wherever Maddie ends up, she's going to be entertaining doing it. Overall, I'm not super high on Maddie's chances. I think she could survive a few tribal councils, but I think the second Hurricane Maddie makes landfall on Ratu Beach, they are probably going to be looking to get rid of her. But no matter how long she's in the game, she'll be fun to watch. I'll go half a point on this one. I think if she could have survived that initial vote, Hurricane Maddie would have properly landed and she would have gotten into a lot of trouble on the island. Unfortunately, Maddie's potential as a chaotic pre-merge flameout will go unfulfilled given Brandon idled her out episode one. I expected an early exit from her, just not this early and not this way. Next up is Helen Lee, who I gave the Natalie White Award for most likely to be underestimated. Yeah, I had high hopes for Helen, which all came crashing down thanks to Carson's shoddy body language reading skills. Here's what I initially said about Helen. 
Helen, I think, has the social skills and awareness to really succeed in this game without being overtly threatening. What impresses me about Helen is that she's very aware of how she'll be perceived and intends to lean into it. She knows she'll be underestimated as a threat a la Erica, and she wants to use those perceived weaknesses, that she's kind of ditzy, as a strength so that she can strategize behind the scenes. I think Helen is going to be dangerous in this game. She's going to play a smart and slow game and will likely be in the power but not out front on her tribe within the first few days. Would not blame anyone for having Helen as a winner pick. Uh, still more accurate than Carson's read. Helen was briefly in the power trio of herself, Carson, and Sarah for about a minute, but I can't give myself any points on this one. I think if Sarah hadn't lost her vote, or if Carson spent more time studying body language and less time studying how to do the NASA font, Helen has a deep run in her. But those things happened, so this is my first major miss of the season. Moving on to our first Soka member to leave the game, Claire Rafson, who I gave the Stephanie Johnson Award for Shock Pre-Merge Boot. Once upon a time, Claire had the most preseason hype of probably any player on this season. Did she live up to it? Here's what I said about Claire preseason. I think Claire's going to be a huge presence on the show in the time she's there. I just don't think it will be long, but I'm worried that Claire's going to play herself out of the game early by being too transparently devious, and I don't think she's going to be able to hide the scheming behind her unassuming exterior as well as she thinks she will. I hope I'm wrong. Claire has fun villain written all over her. But I think on a tribe that is on the surface, at least full of some of the more laid back personalities, she could be in trouble. Regretfully, pre-merge. I think my read of Claire's personality was correct. In her brief time on the show, she was a fun and slightly devious little antagonist to our main Soka players. But Claire was sent packing by the Sokas over an even bigger schemer, Josh, because she wasn't contributing in challenges. Or even participating in them. Claire was a pretty surprising pre-jury boot given the preseason hype, but it wasn't really for the reasons I thought. Then again, there's always one player who has preseason hype who crashes and burns, so I'm not saying this was some incredible read or anything. Paging Max Dawson. Regretfully, half a point. Next, let's look at Sarah Wade winner of the Darnell Hamilton Award for most likely to be an early boot for literally no reason. I initially read Sarah as a laid back player who would just kind of be an early boot by default. The kind of player who goes home because the die just lands on them and it's time to vote. Here's why I thought that. She's got a good head for the game, but I'm just feeling like Chelsea Walker vibes. And I honestly feel like this is kind of a bad tribe draw for Sarah. In tribes of six, there's nowhere to hide. Any little thing or no thing at all can get you voted out. And this is a tribe full of big, persuasive personalities. If the votes are trending towards Sarah for whatever reason, is she going to be able to deflect them onto someone else? I don't know. I feel like Sarah's going to need to lock down alliances quickly, or else she'll be wading into Ponderosa fast. Full point here. Sarah was idled out by Josh because of a tiff between Carolyn and Jam Jam. If that doesn't scream went home for no reason, I don't know what does. Moving on to Matthew Grinstead Maley, who I gave the Ricard Foyer Award for most likely him Spradlin. Matthew is our lowest placing him Spradlin in this award's history, but also the only one to climb a giant rock and fall off of it. So checks out. Here's what I said about Matthew preseason. If this guy doesn't slay this game and have fun doing it, I'll eat my hat. This is the kind of player who just has the good at survivor look. The kind of guy who you don't even need to read the bio or watch them. Just look at the cast photo. This guy's going to be good at survivor. He's got charisma. He's got people skills. He's got game sense. He's going to have a good showing. Unfortunately, there's an expiration date on this type of player. They top out at final six or final five over an inability to control their threat level. But you can expect Matthew to go pretty far, assuming he, you know, didn't die when he fell off that cliff. 
about that last part. I'm going full point on this one despite Matthew's understandable late merge quit due to his shoulder injury sustained from falling off said Cliff. Matthew was playing the exact type of game I expected to see from him. Devious yet fun, but not mean-spirited. At least he lived on through Jamie's fake idol, which ended up making more of an impact in the game than he ultimately did. Uh, rock fall excluded. Next, let's take a look at Dr. Josh Wilder, who I awarded the Peter Bagenstoss Award for most likely to think they're the mastermind. A medical doctor? Having ego issues on Survivor? No way. Here's what I said about Josh. Joshua's overcome a lot in real life, but I'm worried for his longevity in the game. I think he's going to be in for a rude awakening. I just feel like Joshua is a little too high on himself heading into the season. Maybe he's been around feet too long, but he's starting to think his own farts smell good. And I get the sense that Joshua will think he's in control of his tribe right up until his torch gets snuffed. I think Josh had a slightly better perception of his place in the game than I thought he would, but it took a really bad swap and a free idol for that to happen. Free swap, Josh's ego made him think he was in control, and he had no idea that basically the entire Soka tribe had his number. Once it kicked in, Josh's Abby Maria-esque streak of escaping the vote last second was actually really fun. He should have gone when Claire went, he should have gone when Sarah went, and finally, at Mergatory, his nine lives ran out. Full point. Moving on, our first juror is Matt Blankenship, who I awarded the Ian Rosenberger Award for Too Nice for Survivor. Matt was this season's Charlie Brown. Without a vote, the entire pre-merge, only to go home in a split tribe twist with the most unfavorable makeup possible for him. I guess nice guys finish first. On the jury. Nice guys are the first juror. Here's what I said about Matt preseason. On paper, he has a decent shot. He's smart, athletic, and has a really chill vibe that I think will make people comfortable. No one's going to come for Matt early on unless he makes them come for him. If he gets in his own head and has doubts or he's not able to jump into those early conversations or he's just too naive and too trusting, he could be heading for an early exit. I think his best bet is to link up with someone else similarly strategic, someone like a Franny who's on the same wavelength, who he can honestly talk strategy with and who can kind of carry him socially through the early part of the game. Well, they talk strategy and uh, a whole lot more. Did I manifest this showmance or what? Matt performed exactly as I anticipated. He found his ride or die, but lacked the killer instinct to really go deep in the game. I think if Soka hit a cold streak, he also would have been in trouble too. And that would have been an entirely self-created downfall point for me on Matt. I deserve it for predicting that Franny alliance. Next, let's look at Brandon Cottom, who I gave the Eddie Fox award for most likely to stumble backwards to the end game. Well, Brandon only sort of stumbled and it wasn't anywhere near the end game. Here's why I thought Brandon would go deep. A lot of super fans end up overthinking themselves out of the game, and there's something to be said about coming into Survivor and just being yourself and rolling with the punches. I don't feel like Brandon will really have his finger on the pulse of what's happening super often, but I think his physicality and likable positive energy will keep him safe pre-merge, and I don't really think he'll be viewed as a strategic threat post-merge. I'm calling a mid-merge bordering on endgame placement for Brandon. I think Brandon had the relaxed temperament and relatively old school style of gameplay I was expecting, but it's hard to call anyone who finds an idol and idols out someone else on episode one lacking a finger on the pulse of the game. Not to mention he was the second juror, not the second to last juror. No points on this one. Finally, three votes into the jury phase of the game, we have reached my pick for the Francesca Hoagie Award for most likely to be the first boot, Kane Fritzler. Kane was not the first boot. He was not the second boot. He was the tenth boot. Why did I think Kane would go home first? My Kane concerns are this. I think he's just overprepared, and his dueling strategies of being over the top schemer like Zeke and find an ally so brain dead they literally cannot lie to him, is the same playbook Geo ran last season, which didn't turn out super well for him. 
I think Kane is going to be out of his element a bit early on. He won't be able to recover socially. And then the scheming and self-preservation impulses are going to kick in when he should be playing it cool. Easy zero pointer on this one. I wouldn't say Kane was a huge threat socially or strategically. I think he was outflanked in both regards by other players on his tribe. But when Ratu hit a hot streak, he successfully wormed his way into the majority and seemed to always have a cool enough head not to panic under pressure. No points for me, but Kane, you made your dog, all caps, survivor, proud. Next, let's look at Franny Marin, winner of the Sammy Leotti Award for Most Promising Zoomer. Well, just by voting record, Carson's gotta be the most promising Zoomer, but Franny was a big surprise and one of the best players and characters of the season for me. Here's what I said about her preseason. I think it's really hard for anyone in their early 20s to win this game, but Franny has the best shot. She's very well aware that she's going to be perceived as an Aubrey or Gabby type and hopes to use that to her advantage to be underestimated. And I think her strategy of being the calm and the center of the new era survivor storm is a good one. And anyone who can survive working in a nail salon for years can hold their own. Franny says she wants to emulate Sophie Clark, which means she probably wants to go with the flow and only rock the boat when it's necessary. I have high hopes for Franny, and I think we will be seeing a good run from her. I'm going to give myself a full point here. Franny was the only person to see the Tika 3 for the threat they were before it was too late, and she was firmly in the power structure of her original Soka alliance, so much so that Danny used his idol to keep her in the game. I do think her game was a little hamstrung by the Matt relationship, but hey, love conquers all. Next, let's look at Danny Massa, winner of the Alec Merlino Award for Biggest In-Game Surprise. For context, everyone was down on Danny preseason just based on his cast photo. They kinda assumed he'd be a total D-bag. Same thing happened to Alec, who turned out to be extremely wholesome and fun to watch. Was that the case for Danny? Danny's going to be a huge fan favorite. Being kind is his proudest accomplishment. Dude applied because his nieces bullied him into it. Danny has enough survivor knowledge to do well strategically, but not so much it's going to be a burden. His tribe will need him in challenges, and he's got a super likable personality. Unless someone on this tribe catches big move-itis, Danny's already punched his ticket to the merge. Okay, Danny was a blast. I personally enjoyed watching someone play a Tony style game without the reads that Tony had. And whether you like him or not, Danny was having a ton of fun playing the heel on Survivor. I personally enjoyed his strategy. He played an aggressive game, but never made things personal. However, I did think Danny would be more relaxed and less rolling around on the ground everywhere. And he certainly played a more assertive and out front game than I expected. I think half a point is fair here. Moving on to our last pre-finale character, Jamie Lynn Ruiz, winner of the Mariano Ketch Award for most likely to have dangerously positive energy. Jamie's positivity is obvious. Even in pre-season interviews, she jumps off the page as a ray of sunshine. And this award is for those players whose positivity can be a major boon for them or a major liability. Here's what I said about Jamie preseason. Jamie's success in the game will depend on her tribe's tolerance for her aggressive positivity. And just looking at the other personalities on this tribe, it seems like this could be a dangerous situation. Are Kane or Maddie going to be down for Jamie's corporate mandated fun? I'm not sure. On the flip side, I could see someone like a Matthew or Lauren scooping her up as a close ally. I do think if she gets a foothold, Jamie will be a dangerous player. She's got a face that just immediately says trustworthy, but she's here to play hard. And climbing the corporate ladder for years gives her plenty of experience in building real-life alliances, and probably a few betrayals, too. Will she blossom like the plants on her TikTok, or will she wither like the plants in my living room? I'm leaning towards the former, but I wouldn't be surprised at the latter. I think I had a pretty good read on Jamie's position in the game. If Exit Press is anything to go by, Jamie was at least in the conversation for first boot, but once she got her social footing, she was everyone's best friend and never really at risk of leaving until the Tika steamroll. I even had her allies pinned down. 
She was close with Matthew pre-merge and ride or dies with Lauren post-merge. I'll give myself a full point here. Jamie would want that for me. Let's take a look at our first finale boot, Lauren Harp, who I awarded the Kathy Vavrick O'Brien Award for most likely to get the growth edit. Lauren had a relatively quiet middle, but a schemy premiere and a sympathetic boot episode. Is that growth? Here's what I said in my initial assessment. Lauren's here not only to play Survivor and get the money in the title, but she also sees Survivor as an opportunity for self-reflection and growth. It's very old school Survivor. I did initially have concerns that Lauren would end up being too vulnerable and too honest for her own good, but then I saw that she wants to emulate the games of Parvati, Natalie, and Shan. Three great players and definitely not three women you could ever accuse of being too honest. I have high hopes for Lauren. She was definitely in consideration for my winner pick, and I'd anticipate a strong showing from her. More than most, Lauren told us exactly how she was going to play, and then did it. She was honest to herself and played to win. Still, I don't think I fully clocked Lauren. Although she had a minor growth narrative, undeniably the growth edit of the season is Carolyn. Still, I think half a point is warranted. I saw her deep run coming and trusted her at her word that she'd play like she said she would, which isn't always the case. If you don't think that's worth half a point, maybe you have your own growth edit to go through. Let's move on to our final four fire-making loser, Carson Garrett. I gave the Will Wall Award for a youngest person who's very young. I give this award for young survivors who are just really young and act like it. Unfortunately for me, I don't really think this applies to Carson. He was wise beyond his years and one of the best players of the season. Here's what I said about him before the season began. It's not Carson's fault that he's 20. That's on his parents. But it is going to be his problem in the game, and there's probably going to be a significant relatability gap for Carson to overcome with the rest of his tribe. I'm just not sure how into Minecraft Bruce is. But I think Carson's going to struggle in this game. I really do think he's going to have a lot of trouble building relationships when the next youngest person is 27. Feeling a strong early boot on this one. Probably the first from his tribe. I really thought Carson was going to struggle to fit in on a tribe much older than him, but honestly, he was the best position player on that tribe and had social connections with every single person. When he got swapped to Ratu, he had that tribe eating out of the palm of his hand. Those are just social skills that I frankly didn't expect out of a 20 year old who printed pillows of his own face and tried to sell them. Like Carson in the fire making, I gotta take the L on this one. Zero points. We are finally at my winner pick. Zero vote final tribal loser, Carolyn Weiger. Winner of the Sandra Diaz Twine Award for most likely to win it all. I was half joking here, but honestly, once I sat down and looked at Carolyn's confidence in being herself, I knew I had to pick her to win. Here's why I thought Carolyn would take home the Carol win. Look at the last three winners we've had and tell me Carolyn doesn't fit like a glove. Carolyn is the perfect embodiment of new era survivor, a big fan with an incredible story and a huge heart, willing to embrace both the unique chaos of survivor in the 40s as well as its humanity. I think the biggest test for Carolyn will be getting beyond that first tribal council. It's easy to look at someone so Caroline-y as an easy first vote, but if she makes it past that first huddle, I think she's going the distance. And winning? Nah, fuck it, why not? I'll give myself half a point here because who else out there had Carolyn not only as a deep run, but also as someone with win equity? Just saying. This was partially just me manifesting the Carolyn carpool going all the way, but also I really believed that if Carolyn could survive her first vote, she could survive them all. Definitely one of my better winner picks in hindsight. Certainly beats Janine. Let's look at second placer Heidi Lagares Greenblatt, who I gave the Tina Wesson Award for equally likely to be the winner or the first boot. Preseason, Heidi was extremely difficult to read for me. I really didn't have a handle on who Heidi was or how she would play, and to be honest, I still kind of have those questions postseason. 
Here's why I hedged my bets on Heidi. I could see this game going either way for Heidi, but I feel like there's a little bit of a gulf in the self-awareness of her game and social sense, so I could see her rubbing her tribe the wrong way a little. But if there's a fair play or Russell type she can play foil to, that could be to her benefit. Heidi is super authentically herself, and her stay in the game will be determined by her tribe's tolerance for high energy Heidi. Okay, firstly, where was high energy Heidi? Heidi, I don't know, I think I anticipated her inflated sense of her own strategic game, but the social connections seem to be there. Although she was actually close allies with the biggest antagonist of her season, Danny, and not his foil. Regardless, I don't think Heidi was ever really at risk of going early, nor was she really a major threat to win down the stretch. So, zero points here. Finally, let's look at our winner, Jam Jam Orocho, who I gave the Donathan Hurley Award for most likely to get the Sia Bucks. Oh, for... This happened with Marianne too. Why do my Sia picks keep winning? Well, he's a millionaire now, so no Sia Bucks for Jam Jam. But here's why I thought he'd be Sia's fave. I'm actually pretty positive on his chances. He's just got such an infectiously and naturally positive energy. This is the kind of guy who could get caught red-handed looking for an idol. Heck, he could walk back into camp with an idol in his hand, and everyone would just laugh it off. That sort of charisma is a gift, and Jam Jam's strength in Survivor 44 will obviously be his social game. I think his lighthearted exterior is going to draw people in, and he'll be persuasive but not pushy in getting what he wants in the game. He'll probably make the merge, but I'm not sure such an upbeat and likable player can make the end after Marianne. Regardless, scoop this guy up first on your fantasy drafts. He's going to get like eight confessionals an episode. Well, all of that is true. We simply have not seen a social game this good in a long time. That final tribal was killer. Also, if you took my advice and picked him first in your fantasy draft, congrats on your win. However, I'll give myself half a point here. Sia gave cash to Carolyn, Carson, and Lauren, and not Jam Jam. Again, only because he won. I otherwise had Jam Jam's game down pat, but I'm principled here. No Sia bucks, no full point. Gotta say, I think this was a pretty solid season of preseason predictions for me. There wasn't the extremely high variance in accuracy we saw in my Survivor 43 cast predictions, some of which were spot on and some of which we don't talk about. Anyway, I've tallied up the points and remember we're shooting for nine out of 18 points here. And the final tally is nine and a half, a full additional half point beyond my goal of nine. Despite a few misses, I think this was my most accurate New Era cast analysis yet. I mean, at the very least, my first boot pick didn't make Final Tribal for the third time in a row. Got nothing else for ya. Hope you enjoyed Survivor 44 as much as I did. I'll be back with more content analyzing the New Era next week. But until next time, don't get idled out. <laughs>